Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to uh, see Quixent's full year 2018 results presentation. I'll very briefly go through a bit about Quixent and the investment case for Quixent, and then I'll lead on to talking a bit more specifically about our results for the full year 2018, uh, which we're announcing today. So Quixent started in 2005, so uh, 13, 14 years old, and uh, specifically set out with an objective to supply uh, specialist computer platforms into the casino and slot machine industry. And the, the, the industry was undergoing a transition at the time away from mechanical real-based machines towards video slots. And what we saw was an opportunity to be a specialist supplier of computer platforms for that industry. And those computer platforms were not just uh, the hardware, but also very importantly, the low level software um, that, uh, that was needed to make those hardware solutions work easily for the, the manufacturers of the machines. And those manufacturers of the machines have one core objective, to get a successful game into the market that players are enticed to play and remain at for as long as possible. And what that means is that they have to spend a lot of their time on game design. So by Quixent becoming what was an outsourced provider of the computer platform, it enabled their software teams to be much more focused on doing the game design, which was really the differentiator for them. And we've built up a, a business in this, um, in, in the computer platforms area. We then moved on to supplying another part of the machine, which was a gaming monitors area. And again, the regulation that exists within the gaming industry is very stringent, and the gaming monitors are subject to that same level of regulation. So whilst the computer platforms um, attract a higher margin uh, than the monitors, which is a more commoditized and, and competitive market, nonetheless, uh, gaming monitors have got some characteristics which make it attractive as a, a business line for us. And then finally, in 2015, we acquired a company uh, called Densitron Technologies, and they supply um, display products into non-gaming markets principally. And why was that interesting to us? Well, because Quixent started from a background of being a technology provider. Uh, we've deployed those skills into uh, the gaming segment as a, as a focus. However, it's not the only segment where we could have um, a significant amount of business. So what we saw Densitron as being is a, a foothold into other vertical markets outside of gaming to be able to um, undertake the same kind of uh, innovative technology provision, provision approach to the one that we did in gaming, um, but finding other market segments to do it. And that business, um, whilst it's a, it's a business which is lower margin than, than the gaming business, is still cash generative and it's still profitable and uh, we, we believe has a, a great future. And we've got some information about that um, in, in this presentation. And we've been able to achieve you know, a very strong um, growth story through that. So when we look at the investment case for Quixent, we've got a strong balance sheet, um, we've got um, strong cash generation and a, and a very healthy balance sheet as a result. And uh, we've delivered double digit growth over several years sustainably, um, which has been helped by um, the, the, the high barriers to entry we believe in the markets that we supply into. And our focus in these key markets into specific verticals allows us to have that focus and to find somewhat niche areas where we can participate and not be attracting competition from the large manufacturers of, uh, of electronics equipment that we would otherwise be facing. And we have a very low level of leverage, uh, which gives us a flexibility for um, future inorganic growth, um, as well as the organic growth that we can see within our core business segments. So key takeaways for 2018, uh, we saw continued strong growth in our core gaming platforms business with a growth in the gaming uh, platform market share to 13%. So there are around half a million machines that are replaced every year within the gaming industry. Um, we supplied 61,000 in 2018, which represents about 13% of that annual replacement cycle. And just to give you the context, um, that half a million uh, machines annually replaced is in the backdrop of about 8 million machines installed based globally. So what drove that uh, growth in business in 2018? It was really um, driven by new business wins that we've announced over the last couple of years starting to deliver revenue. So we had um, several new customers, including some of the biggest size customers in the industry that we started to see revenue streams flowing through from. And what was pleasing is that 
In 2018, we also saw some headwinds from some of the customers that we'd had um, in, our, in our business for many years, not performing quite as well as we have seen in the past. So despite the fact that some of our key customers were not uh, consuming the volumes that they had in the past, we had a year where we saw very buoyant growth of 14% in our, in our gaming platform's business. Gaming monitors, we took a strategic decision not to continue to participate with certain pieces of business that were being put under increasing levels of margin pressure. And uh, that was principally in the main screen area of the gaming monitors market. And I will explain a bit more about how that differentiates from what is a more interesting area, which is button decks, uh, where we did see growth in the year. We also saw a year where uh, margins were maintained despite the fact electronic components were undergoing a significant dislocation last year with shortages. So we saw um, you know, prices of these components going up and we also saw lead times being pushed out. And despite that, by us being ahead of that, um, that trend and buying parts in advance, we managed to maintain our margin through that period, which we were uh, very pleased about during the year. Uh, Densitron, we've now got a very clear um, uh, strategy for the business and we've made significant progress in repositioning that business um, and we've seen initial encouraging results from the broadcast sector which is the first of these um, key vertical markets that we're targeting uh, within Densitron's business. We've made significant uh, changes to the management of the business over the year to implement a divisional organisational structure um, so Densitron and Gaming now operate as two operational divisions and then we have a corporate um, that oversees those two uh, and has certain shared services such as HR and legal uh, IT that are um, shared between them to make it a more efficient structure. And within that also key hires including uh, to my right Guy Millwood as CFO um, that we brought in during the year and that um, we believe gives us a very strong foothold for uh, future growth within Quixen. Thank you, John. Moving on to uh, some of the detail behind those key takeaways for the year. If we start on the profit and loss account, uh, right up at the top, we've got um, all the, the main revenue movements there. So, so the overall gaming business, a 9% growth, that masks the, uh, the sort of ups and downs be, uh, between monitors and platforms. Platforms, as John said, very uh, good, strong growth at 14%. That's 61,000 units shipped against 52,000 the year before. And if you look back over the last two or three years, you'll see that's a that's 9,000 extra units added to that base each year. So a 22% a um, compound average growth rate over the last three years. And the, the platforms um, business has got a 28% revenue compound annual growth rate over those three years. So good, solid growth that, uh, that talks to uh, what John mentioned in the investment case there. The monitors business was down year on year as we made a deliberate decision to move to higher margin business and away from some of the lower margin deals we had been doing. And the, the monitors business came back very strongly in the second half of the year. If you've seen the interim results, you'll see we did about two and a half million uh, of that 15 million revenue in the first half of the year and 12 and a half million in the second half. So, so a big change once we'd, uh, we'd actually decided to move away from the lower margin business. Densitron business, flat year on year. It's been a, a $38 million business since we bought it. Uh, but we've got some growth potential in that business that we'll come to in a few slides time. But overall, it's, it's maintained the business that it's doing and is contributing quite well from a cash point of view to the, uh, the business overall. Uh, the cost of sales number there points to uh, a number we've been running hard to keep uh, up um, within the business. That's the, the gross margin of the business. So we ended up with a 35% gross margin uh, against the 34% uh, the, the prior year. The improvement in that margin uh, points to exactly what's happening in the, in the monitors business. We've been selling more higher margin product. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a huge improvement because we've also been battling headwinds in our supply chain, where we've got a lot of uh, component pricing issues, a lot of shortages in some of the things we need to buy, and we've got very significant lead times. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a second when we talk about the inventory on, on the next slide, um, because you, you'll see there's been a, a build in that inventory so we can make sure that we will be able to deliver sales throughout 2019. Underlying operating expenses are up year on year. This is, this is all down to headcount increases. We've been increasing the number of people we've got in the business in the, in the sales area, in the R&D area, and in the, in the product and manufacturing. You'll, you'll be pleased to know we haven't added any management and admin. It's, this is really all going on the frontline stuff that's delivering product to customers uh, and actually selling it to them in the first place. And so we're well set up. We don't think we're going to be increasing that base um, much above what we're at now uh, over the next year or two. 
Um, that brings us to an adjusted profit increase year on year uh, up to 18.2 million uh, pounds. You can see it split between Densitron and the gaming division. Uh, that split becomes less meaningful going forward as we have more corporate resource, if you like, that's working on both parts of the business. But I think that the key numbers uh, that, that we look at are uh, uh, on the, the split between the divisions are really the revenue numbers and, and the margins that we've already spoken about. Um, we have some uh, adjustments to uh, profit before tax for the year, mainly uh, due to the restructuring charges uh, that we've had. We have largely completed the restructuring around the Densitron acquisition in this year. There are, there are one or two uh, charges that are not people related in there. There's one for the, the closure of the, uh, the Densitron uh, finish business. And there's also um, uh, an extra charge for an increase in deferred consideration on uh, the uh, Alpha Displays acquisition uh, from uh, 2015. Uh, that uh, that bring us to the three million. Those are those are shown as adjustments because they're considered to be one-off. We don't expect them those to be repeating costs. Um, I think about half a million of them were, were were in the interim numbers that were already published, uh, and the uh, the completion of the exercise took us to three million. Some of which will be a, a cash cost in early 2019. Most of which was paid for in uh, in the 2018 cash flow. And finally, on the on the profit and loss account, the uh, the effective tax rate for the year is very low. Uh, that's largely down to um, some prior um, adjustments for uh, Taiwanese share option exercises that we were able to get through our uh, UK tax returns in 2018, and that's re resulted in an effective tax rate of only one percent. We expect that tax rate to be back up to more normal rates in the in the ten to fifteen percent that you will have seen Quixen at in prior years. And the reason it's not, if you like, the full um, UK tax rates is because we get substantial R&D tax credits and patent box relief from the, the number of patents that we've got in our products that allow us to actually get taxed at a much lower rate, 10% when, uh, when you sell goods that have a UK patent on them. Can I just ask you a bit about your, uh, your approach to R&D and capitalization? Because looking at your accounts, uh, you say expenses during the year, group expenditure on research and development <coughs> increased by 21% to $6.4 million, representing 16% of gross profit. Uh, and you then capitalized 2.6 million of those, so that's 40% capitalization. Right. Um, whereas the previous year, the figures were 5.3 million and 1.6 million, and that's 30%. Why have you hiked it from 30 to 40%? So. There, were, there is a couple of effects. One is that we um, have started now capitalising some costs in Densitron that are for R&D. So remember, Densitron is a business which has been principally distribution um, up till um, last year, and there started to be some development work which has gone into products, one of which I've got a photograph of um, later on in the slide. So that was a kind of a new area for us for um, IP generation we previously haven't had. Uh, within the group. And then the other the other part of it is um, within the, the gaming monitor segment. Again, it was a business which was first starting, um, in, in, we first started in 2015. And again, in that, at the beginning, there was quite a lot of expenses that were attached to it where, you know, the product wasn't directly identifiable as being, you know, um, a saleable asset because we were building something new for the first time. Again, now we've got certain areas of IP that blocks that we've generated within that, that we've uh, therefore been able to capitalise a saleable product. So what should one look, be looking, expecting you to do going forward? Is it sort of 30 to 40% you're going to be capitalising? Yeah, we've not changed any policy around capitalisation. So our policy is always unchanged. In Taiwan, we capitalise 75%, um, is it, of the, of the R&D um, spend, and it's all based on you know, timesheet evidence. Um, and then in Italy, we don't capitalise any of the R&D expenditure. And there's a simple reason for that. So whilst in theory, actually, Italy generate um, technology and they, they, they undertake R&D work, which probably is more differentiating than the work that's done in Taiwan, because it's what is principally where we find innovation and the ability to patent. Um, Italy's role is split between support and R&D. And so there's a grey area, which is support and which is R&D, and therefore we take the prudent view that we don't capitalise the R&D done in Italy. So in theory we could, but we, we decide not to, which is why there is a lower level of R&D capitalisation we potentially could have. To a large extent, you, you are um, forced by accounting standards to capitalise R&D. If, if what you're developing is commercially viable, 
Um, and obviously, it's technically possible to make it. Um, after, and if, after you've got over that hurdle of proving that, then you are required to capitalise R&D to reflect the fact that the cost it has a life that is longer than the year it's usually expended in. Absolutely understand. Um, I so, it seems 40% is quite a lot. Well, it, it, I think it, it points to the fact that what we're developing is is um, usually saleable to customers, and therefore we um, we have to spread it over the life of what the, the products expect. I mean, to be. M maybe the other part here is an understanding of what our policy is with regards to product development. So we don't typically do entirely blue sky product development. So um, you know, we've tried to find a phrase that determines how we describe our R and D. Um, and I think customer aware is probably the, the right way to describe it. So we're not customer led because that implies very reactive. Um, we're not blue sky, which implies that you're always trying to be something that you don't know if you've got a market for. Um, what we try and do is we try and listen to what customers um, are asking us for. Um, so the sales team are, are pivotal in deciding what new development work goes on. But it's not that we just deliver what the customer asks for. So that, you know, in an ideal world for me, the customer asks for 70% of what we actually deliver and that 30% is where we innovate. So it's innovation which is led by a known commercial need. And what we try and do is solve that commercial need slightly better than the customer asked for in the first place. And that's where we have found the ability to patent in the past. So it is very, very sales centric R&D, which is why, um, you know, maybe if you look at other businesses where there is a very low um, le or low ability to capitalise tangible products, um, it, it, you know, quicks and looks like it's got a higher percentage. But actually, as I said, the, we don't capitalise a big part of the business that we could be. The costs in Italy are, are not capitalised at all because it's too difficult to separate out what's um, what's the customer support and what's R&D activity. Um, moving on to the, the cash flows uh, on the next slide, and we, we deal with uh, most of the main movements in the, in the balance sheet here as well. You can see operational cash flow has improved during the year. We still think we've got some a more room for improvement there. You can see there's a big outflow on receivables. That was really down to Q4 sales timing, most of it being in, uh, in December, which pushed down the amount of cash we could actually collect in the year. You can read from that that there's been a, a very strong cash inflow in the first quarter of 2019 uh, because of those receivables available to collect. Um, and I've, I've put the number there on the, on the right-hand side in the orange box. The inventory movement is actually positive during the year. We've been uh, very closely monitoring in inventory levels. Um, we, we mentioned already that we've had uh, long lead times on certain raw materials. And, and if you if you look at the, the detail that's on the balance sheet uh, published in the, uh, in the annual report that came out this morning as well, uh, you'll see that the, the in inventory level of raw material has gone up a lot. Um, that's because we're having to hold what we call strategic stock for long lead time parts, mainly uh, passive components like resistors and capacitors. Um, and with, uh, about three million of, of that inventory balance relates to uh, those, those strategic long lead time purchases. We're also holding a reasonable amount of what we call end of life stock. So these are components that suppliers have, have ceased uh, to supply, but we need to hold to continue to be able to provide our products over the next few years. Uh, game, game boards have quite a long lifetime. And, uh, and so we have to hold stock to make sure we can um, deliver um, several years worth of sales. And there's, there's $4 million worth of, of stock on the balance sheet that represents that. Everything else um, represents either um, as yet unmade product, but a product that has been ordered by customers or finished goods. Um, and we're holding uh, somewhat less than two months of finished goods stock for, uh, for sales at, at any one point in time. So the inventory levels are something that we'll, we'll have to continue to monitor and work with quite closely, but they're for a, a business that's now uh, turning over in excess of $100 million a year, we'll have to hold reasonable inventory levels to cover for all of those variables that I've mentioned. Tax paid during the year is, um, is actually an outflow despite the, the small um, amount in the P&L. We actually had a refund uh, just after the year ends. Had that come in in the 2018 year, that, that the tax paid would have been zero in the year. Um, but going forward, as I say, you can expect us to be paying uh, tax at 10% uh, or just above um, because of the, the R&D tax credits that we get. Uh, the CapEx, um, as the gentleman mentioned, is mainly going on uh, R&D. 2.6 million of that 3.5 million is for capitalised R&D. A lot of the rest of it is, is on the uh, systems implementations we've been uh, putting in uh, to, uh, to give the business 
a, a better infrastructure going forward. Um, we, we've put in um, a, a large um, SAP um, implementation. I'm pleased to say that that goes live next Monday. It's been thoroughly tested and, uh, and uh, that investment will, will start to pay dividends uh, from uh, the, the next few days onwards. Gives us much better visibility over the whole, whole organization. Now we've got one infrastructure in place uh, to look at it. We've repaid almost all of our borrowings in the year. Um, there is still, as, as we speak today, a, uh, a mortgage on a building in Taiwan. Um, it's the only remaining debt. Uh, and that, that debt actually gives us access to certain letters of credit that, that, that make goods movement easier sometimes uh, in and out of Taiwan. And so we will uh, keep an eye on whether we need to keep that uh, mortgage in place just because it gives us certain bank access that we have that we would not have if we didn't have it. And it's actually at a very low interest rate, just over 1%. So we, uh, we, won't, we won't be paying out a great deal of interest in 2019 on it. Um, and overall, leaving us with a, a net 9.7 million cash position, out of which we're intending to pay a 3.1p dividend, so a 19% increase on last year's dividend, should the shareholders approve it uh, at the AGM in April. And that payment will be made in, in mid-May. Finally, on, on numbers slides, if we move to slide nine, the one-headed game division segmental analysis, we, we talk in a bit more detail about what's been happening in some of the revenue numbers. In the top right there, we split down the monitor sales into button decks and to, to main screens as we call them. And you can see the, the button decks are an increasing part of that revenue number and we expect that to, to increase further over 2019 given the, the profile of orders that we're expecting to see and that we've already got uh, for those products. Um, the, the two uh, graphs on the left-hand side talk to uh, the increasing percentage of our revenues from uh, what we call tier one or, or large scale customers. So these are big gaming machine manufacturers who, uh, who buy our products. And we've increasingly spoken um, over the years about increasing our penetration of those tier one customers, as we call them. And you can see um, in the bottom slide there that the proportion of products sold uh, in the platforms business that's that sold to customers who take more than 5,000 pieces a year has increased by um, over 50% in the year. So there's a, a big increasing penetration into those bigger customers that buy larger volumes of products. And in the in the top graph there, uh, in the in the orange box in, in particular, you can see a large increase in what we call the cost effective product set. And this is driven by, again, a couple of big customers who are taking much larger volumes of our products. From a margin point of view, we're, we're sort of agnostic between the, uh, the categories of cost-effective, mid-range, high-end there. We, we make similar margins in, in all of those categories, but um, we've seen uh, customers, and one or two in particular, uh, taking much more of the cost-effective ranges as our penetration has gone um, into, uh, into some of those bigger customers. And the final graph on the right-hand side uh, at the bottom there uh, talks about the growth in market share every year. And it's been, a, it's been generally a, a two percentage uh, share of the uh, market has been gained every year for the past certainly four years. And um, the, the graph here starts in 2013 when, when Quixent uh, floated on the market. And you can see it's been a, a relatively uh, continuous growth since then. And, and given what we know about the pipeline going forward, we're expecting to see that growth continue. But we'll talk a bit more about that in some of the slides to come. On slide 10, I've, we've talked through a few of these points. Um, a couple I'd like to bring out on top of that. Um, so as a business, we were very concentrated on a very small number of customers. Um, that um, number of customers has continued to be diversified um, over the last few years and in, in 2018 despite the fact that we had you know, a couple of our uh, key customers having um, slower years. And that's something that's persisted into the early part of this year. We still managed to grow the business very healthily. And that's because of these, these new business wins um, that were um, contributing to the growth um, and therefore giving us a, a more diversified revenue stream. And we've seen that uh, with these largest customers, our so-called gaming ecosystem, which is our cornerstone of the value proposition that we have, um, is a an excellent route to getting into the software teams within these customers. So we've got in, in a couple of slides time, we explain a bit more what that is, but really what, what and the gaming ecosystem is, is it's a series of hardware, software, and support uh, operating model, which allows um, somebody that's designing games to bring their game to market quicker um, for less, for less uh, investment. 
And the other thing we've announced in these results is a new business opportunity pipeline that's in excess of $30 million. So Quixent has a very healthy um, growth trajectory ahead of it. Um, and um, whilst we have some challenges at the moment with some of our key accounts um, and the consumption they're at, there is a significant uh, opportunity ahead of us for new business, uh, which is uh, reflected in that uh, figure. So sports betting is something that's very topical, very trendy at the moment. Um, our recent exhibition at ICE, um, at the ICE exhibition that was at XL in February, saw a 40% increase in uh, space sold and the 40% increase in space sold was all to sports betting companies. The great thing with sports betting is that these companies have been operating online for some time, but they're all software companies. So when they want to take sports betting to a physical location, they need a terminal or a machine, uh, and the companies have zero experience of building terminals or machines. Um, so that's leading to a very good opportunity for us in, in that particular market space. Um, so just flicking the slide on, onto page 12, um, we realized a few years ago that with the barriers from the hardware team that I spoke about, how else could we start to penetrate these, these tier ones if the hardware teams were proposing uh, or we're putting up some barriers to, to, to Quixent. So we felt that by, and what we, were, what we were learning is that the software teams within these organizations were much more open to our value proposition because it solved a lot of problems for them. Traditionally, when they tried to develop a new machine, software were always ready before hardware. So it was always the hardware team that were dictating the timeline. But when they worked on some projects with Quixent, where Quixent were providing the hardware, uh, suddenly those delays through hardware design were no longer present and they were able to get to market much quicker. And still the, the, the strong value that, that, that Quixent bring to the, the party is time to market. When we first started this, our customers were all very strong in their home markets. The home markets were all very saturated. The only way they could find growth was to go to external new markets. And that's where they required a new compliant platform for those rules. And that's where Quixent was able to help them get in, in and supplying in those markets quicker than they'd been able to do um, in the past. So the, the, the strong value that we add is, is time to market. Uh, and, that, and, and with our ecosystem, um, we're able to demonstrate that through the software team in a much more effective way than we could with the, with the hardware team. So we realized a couple of years back, the more we could do to enhance our ecosystem uh, and provide value add software to our customers, the more likely we were to get drag through in some of the tier ones. And again, the growth that we had last year was through projects in tier ones from I exactly that scenario. So we saw tier ones adopt our platform for side projects where they needed time to market and the software teams had a strong influence on what hardware was chosen because they were under pressure to deliver something quickly. So on slide 13, uh, first of all, if we look at the picture, what you can see there is one of our customers' machines. So you can see the main screens and the topper, um, which are the sort of the more kiosk type screens. So that's the segment of gaming monitors, which is very competitive. It looks very, like, very much like any kind of um, uh, any kind of screen that you see on a kiosk. The bit that's more differentiated is the button deck, and, and that's a part of that machine that we supply. So it's the, it's the interface that the player interacts with to play the game. So it's usually a touch screen. It's often got a physical button inserted within it so that you can spin um, the reels for the game. And that is something that you don't typically find something similar to that on, on a kiosk. So that's one of the reasons why it's a more differentiated segment of the market. And the mechanical design of that, um, the, the uh, lighting effects on it, the way the button's handled, um, the, the robustness of the design is all critical because they take um, quite a lot of abuse in, 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 in the machines, in, in the um, venues where they're played. So that button deck area is where we've been focusing a lot of our business and um, we supplied 30, just over 13,000 button decks um, during the year, which was up on the previous year. And um, that um, has led us to being more focused within that button deck segment as a, as a future. So on slide 14, um, Densitron is a business which has supplied um, typically display components and possibly those also incorporating a touch screen. Uh, into uh, many different industrial vertical markets. But those display components are very competitive. Um, and so it's been limited the extent to which A, Dentistron is able to grow and B, the extent to which Dentistron is able to command premium prices uh, for those products. 
So what we see as a business strategy for Densitron is to move them towards being an enabler of um, customers that have currently got mechanical-based control devices to move into touchscreen-based control. And what that blends is both the display components, which Dentstron has got such a long heritage in supplying, but also with um, hardware or computer hardware to drive high resolution displays um, that, uh, that, that sit in front of them. And then furthermore, on top of that, to try and blend the best of touchscreen technology with some element of tactility that allows you to sen have a sensation of touch attached to it. So an example being um, haptics are an area where um, it allows you to feel a touchscreen when you press it. It's already widely used on things like iPhones and on mobile phones, but in industrial, it's really not been deployed at all. So we see haptics as one of the different types of technology that we can start to incorporate within these embedded solutions. Um, but on top of that, there's also um, a, a move for us to try and integrate um, physical um, overlays on top of the touchscreen that can be uh, repurposed for different um, context sensitive um, operations, but allow somebody that wants to uh, have the best of touchscreen technology and the best of reprogrammability, but blended with some degree of tactility for critical functions that you don't find easy to use on a, on a touchscreen surface. So, so Densitron Stratley is an enabler of human machine interface control surfaces for uh, specific vertical markets. And the first of those vertical markets where we've um, been focusing our efforts is the broadcast sector. And within that market, we've been uh, exhibiting a number of broadcast shows, including the NAB show in Las Vegas. Uh, and we exhibited at the 2018 show and won the Best of Show Award for the U Ready uh, product range, uh, which uh, you see on this page here. And uh, as a result of that focus into one vertical market from a company which has been pretty much flat on revenues over, over 10 years, uh, we've now got a business pipeline of new broadcast opportunities, which is four and a half million. So we've started to see the green shoots of growth coming through from Densitron by virtue of this focus on A, uh, products which have got more, differentiated, more differentiation and more value attached to them, and B, by virtue of a focus on specific verticals. And it's not fair to say broadcast is the only vertical that we can go into in this space, but what we're trying to do is to do one vertical at a time and do it well so that we capitalise on a niche. And then once we've built up a good business in it, we then move on to the next one and try and use the lessons learned from that. And I guess what we've done with broadcast is try and use the lessons we learned in gaming and try and deploy them, albeit in a slightly different, um, with a different product set, but use those same lessons to deploy something into broadcast, which blends those components of, of, of display, hardware and software together. On, on the next slide, just to explain a bit about the broadcast value chain. So what, what does the broadcast industry mean? So at the very top of the sector, you have the, 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 the end users of the, um, of, of the technology that Quixent could supply. So there's some household names such as a BBC in there, Sky, et cetera. So those, those companies in that, it's estimated make $600 billion worth of revenue uh, from, from the end consumers. Um, then if you go a step down, you've got, the, the, you've got the vendors of equipment and services to those broadcast organizations. So the likes of Sony, JVC, Ross, et cetera. So they have a $51 billion total revenue um, opportunity within those uh, end broadcasters, of which 22 billion is equipment and the remainder is services. So those, those middle tier are principally our customers. That's who we're aiming to sell to uh, today. And then below that, it's where we play. So we, we have an ambition to deliver control and monitoring um, equipment to those customers. And we believe that across that whole vendor market, there's a $2 billion addressable market for Densitron to supply into. So just to give you some context of where that stands versus gaming, in gaming, if we supplied everybody in gaming with a computer platform and a monitor and button decks, that would be a $1 billion market. So broadcast, we believe, is a, is a big market for us to go after and therefore worth our while in pursuing. So, We've got lots of different areas that we can play into in that space, um, but really what it's about for us is to generating these um, differentiated products, is to continue with a focused sales discipline into those vertical markets, and for the remainder of the Denstron business that is a, sort of the current revenue book is to maintain that as efficiently as possible so that we have any new growth being used to deployed, being deployed into um, in new, new business opportunities within that vertical market.
And with that, um, we we have a strengthened business for growth. So we've talked about the the uh, appointment of Guy as as Group CFO. We've also hired a new head of corporate operations, which sits in this corporate um, division of the business. But then also within Denstrom, we've had two significant hires that have been uh, appointed in early 2019. So first of all, Martin Gates has joined us uh, from the 1st of January as uh, Denstrom product director. He has a long pedigree in the broadcast sector. Um, he's been involved in uh, in commercial roles in the broadcast sector. He's an engineer by heart, but he also is, um, he's been lecturing on the future of broadcast and he's a known speaker on the circuit. So he's somebody that we have you know, a lot of confidence, has a good visibility of what's happening in that industry and therefore can drive the product strategy within Densitron um, very effectively. And we've also hired a new managing director for Densitron, Simon Jones who's due to start in 2019 as well. And he, again, has a very strong background in, in management, um, including in some high profile firms such as Dyson. So uh, we're very pleased to have those on board. And we think that with that business strategy on Densitron um, now clearly defined, the momentum that we've built up in broadcast and the products that we've built up within that, alongside a strong management team, um, that company's in a very good shape um, for future growth. And a lot of the restructuring that we did last year that's in the numbers that Guy mentioned is, is around creating a globalised business within Densitron rather than the series of individual companies that were operating almost autonomously in the past. So now we have a globally managed product team and we have individual sales subsidiaries uh, which sell those products rather than in the past where it was an individually managed businesses um, that were linked only really by name. So when we look ahead, so what what's, what are the drivers within our gaming uh, core business? Um, so Japan remains a new market opening. Um, there was a, a, a gambling bill or several gambling bills that have been passed, uh, the result of which there are now three locations where there are going to be new integrated resorts um, built. One of those is in Osaka, um, and there is now a, a bidding war between some of the major casino operators such as Sands, MGM and Galaxies um, that are bidding for the license to operate a new integrated resort in that space. But the thought with Japan is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a prolific gambling um, habit in Japan and the belief is that the Japanese market has the potential to be very large indeed, and indeed some people have said potentially the second largest globally. And so Japan, whilst it's a longer term um, future growth, it shows that the gaming industry still is buoyant and has a potential of long term growth. So the first resort is, is anticipated to be open by 2024 or 2025. So the, the demand for gambling is satisfied at the moment by pachinko machines. And I think there's more pachinko machines in Japan um, than there are slot machines in the rest of the world. Um, when will you start to see revenue from Japan, from that marketing? We, we already see Revenue Japan. When we were aware that the market was going to open, the logic that we had was that it's likely that Japanese players are going to want to play machines developed by Japanese game developers. So we consciously, consciously tried to target the Japanese manufacturers a, a year or two ago. Um, and that's what we've been working on. And that's where we've secured these button deck designs with one of the um, main Japanese manufacturers already in the hope that that's going to lead us into the platform business that we've been busy working on trying to win for the last 18 months. So we already have business now, several million dollars from this Japanese company. Um, we, we've just, a, we're hopefully just about to win another button deck project for their machines for a different market. So that will be two main projects with them. And then, as I said, hopefully we'll secure their logic business. So the potential is there. If or, or now when the Japanese market opens, you would expect that they'll go from a sort of 10,000 machine company a year to hopefully 15, 20,000 as they start to supply the lion's share of, of the Japanese uh, market. So yeah, already we have revenues, but we're expecting their machine sales to jump once the Japanese market opens in sort of 2024, 2025. So the Japanese manufacturers already supply heavily to North America, to you know, Macau, to other markets globally. So they have a lot of business in other markets today. So it's not a fruitless exercise chasing that business, even if the Japanese market hadn't been opening. But clearly it's important um, addition to their potential revenues if, we, um, if, if we're supplying to them in the Japanese Our market. Our position to sell to them got more attractive because they then became aware that suddenly they're going to need a machine for a new market with a new set of rules. So when the rules for Japan come, it's going to be a gold rush. Whoever gets their machines ready and approved first will be on the list of, of, of machines that the casinos can buy. 
if you're busy changing your own internal platform and it's taking you two years to meet the rules, you're going to miss the lion's share of orders. So for this Japanese customer, it was attractive to have us come in now because when they do their machine for Japan, they know that our box will be the first box compliant with those rules because we'll make sure we work with a regulator to, to set the standard that our box then becomes compliant with the rules for that market and it's, it's just a case they can put it in the machine. Regulator already knows it's our box. Oh, it's a Quixent box. I approved that last week with somebody else. It's a tick. Let's get on to the other bits of the machine that we need to approve. So that was the logic behind you know, chasing the, the Japanese players. So we've got one of them. We, we have now engaged with the other one. Since the end of last year, we've started in an engagement process with the other one and we're busy working on um, you know, what we can do for those guys. So sports betting is another interesting driver of um, business. So self-service betting terminals have been something we have supplied in the past uh, within Quicks and Gaming. Um, and we um, see a significant opportunity for uh, further deployment of self-service betting terminals, both in the European market, but also in North America, as there is a, a gradual move towards um, the allowance of betting in, in states and outside of Nevada in North America. And uh, you know th there are some headwinds to the North American widespread um, gambling base, but it is something that directionally um, it's, it's felt is going to gradually happen uh, over time. And we've got discussions with several manufacturers around that and have some products which, um, you know, which, which we are finalising now for that market. It's fair to say that our standard product that we have into gaming would be compliant for the requirements of um, what's called GLI 33. However, it's probably slightly, it's, it's a, slight, a bit of a, sned, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And so there's some bits on it which we could probably leave off to save some of the cost from it, um, which would make it compliant with the um, just the sports betting rules. But overall, the gaming market remains supportive and there is there remains about half a million machines a year that are being uh, replaced. And so um, we, we continue to be optimistic that we can um, deliver a significant amount of uh, market share growth uh, into that market and that will translate through to um, significant improvements in quicks and revenues. So I think we've said a lot of this. I think the major point to make is Quicks still has a great future. Um, so our business is very strong. We have a new business opportunity pipeline within gaming of over $30 million. So um, despite some of the shorter term headwinds, we have a, an excellent um, opportunity to grow Quicks and materially from where it is today within the gaming business. And then on top of that, Densitron uh, continues to, um, to, trade, to trade profitably. And indeed, within the new segment of the business broadcast, which we've um, started to focus on, we have a four and a half million dollar um, order pipeline for that, which is um, over 10% of their revenue. So Densitron has a good future as well, and we're starting to see the green shoots of that. So overall, um, with our strength, strength and management team, um, and um, those opportunities ahead of us, we believe Quixen has um, a very good, strong growth outlook. Can I just clarify on the guidance? When you mm. say it will be the H2 weighting will be stronger than in prior years, is mm -hmm. that i.e. Str stronger than the 60-40 that we've seen, yes. excluding 2017? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Can I ask about the operating expenses, which are underlying operating expenses, which went up to um, 2.3 million? Budgeting for the uh, for the next year, what are your expectations? Do you do you intend to continue to grow at that rate or is no? That so, a as, one -off? so as Gary said, you know there was this degree here of scaling up in operating expenses. It's been uh, it's not been a straight line or operating expenses, you know, with with revenue streams. So it's been a function of what products we're selling. So adding gaming monitors has been a sort of a step change in game in, in operating expenses to service that new area of the business, certain new skills that you need for it um, that we didn't have previously in the company. Um, Densitron, there's been a degree of increase in operating expenses for certain new again types of product that we want to do for that segment. But no, I mean I think one of the benefits for Quixent is we have quite a flexible um, operating expense model. Um, so we outsource manufacture. So that area of the business, we don't take on a load of cost just for manufacturing of product. Um, so I don't think we will see a significantly higher operating expense in 2019 versus 2018. We 
um, through the reorganization of the business and in particular within Densitron, we saved a lot of cost because we had a lot of duplication of operational overhead, of management overhead that we really didn't need. So that has given us a more lean business. Um, and I think our, our view is we want to keep managing the company as it grows to continue to remain lean and not to become sort of, you know, inefficient or, or um, um, or, or sort of, you know, unproductive in certain parts of the business. And, and one of the reasons why we've gone through this SAP project is it allows us, for example, to have a much more centralised finance team. Otherwise, you have to have a finance team in every company uh, within the group, which, which clearly isn't a, a good model. And then certain things like um, gaining management data on sales, when you've got a, a separated um, ERP system and MRP system, that becomes more complicated to generate. So you end up with more people analyzing that data, whereas if a computer can do it, that's the model for SAP. So we've gone through the route of trying to create a more streamlined business. Um, and that's always gonna be our intention as the company grows to avoid becoming, um, b becoming overweight and overheads in any areas. Okay, and the, the other thing is uh, the components side of it. You, you seem to imply that you had uh, a one year of particular foresight. Do, do you anticipate that margins will be hit in the current year? Or is it's, your... It's starting, your to, <coughs> it's starting to ease, actually. So if you look at DRAM, um, and it's not in the slides here, but in, in our um, annual report, we've done a, a, a chart which shows the pricing of DRAM going back to 2016. And it's really a peak at the middle of last year and it's then coming back again. So at the moment in inventory, we don't hold a huge strategic holding in DRAM because the pricing is normalizing again. Um, when you look at some of the passive component prices, they remain steadfastly overpriced and long lead time. So we have still got a strategic holding of those, but that's something we track what the, the, the industry trends are uh, and what principally what supply is coming into the market. And then we try and um, moderate our holding as that happens. But you don't expect that to have an impact on margin? It should have a positive effect on the margin this Hopefully. year is our expectation. The, the way I'd describe it is in previous years to last year, our ability to strategically purchase, and I guess principally what I'm saying is our willingness to hold stock, our willingness to pay um, at the point of order for the stock rather than getting credit terms has allowed us to get better than budgeted cost of sales. Last year, we just got budgeted cost of sales. It didn't get better because we were working against these headwinds. So in the past, we've always had a nice surprise from our gross margin. The last year, we didn't have a nice surprise. It was what we budgeted. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.